Welcome to our latest Decoding China series. Today, we're going to listen in on a discussion between macro polo experts, Damian Ma, Alari Mazzocco, and Matt Sheehan. Um, as you can see, we're having a little bit of technical difficulties, and we're trying to get everyone else on camera, but we're still going to start the conversation nonetheless. So the next decade of economic statecraft will revolve around competition in green and emerging technologies, AI, batteries, chips, solar panels, and electric and autonomous vehicles. Like all major economies, China wants leadership across every one of those domains. So I think now is a really good time for us to take stock of where China is and where it intends to go in the two areas that will shape its economy, technology and energy. So first, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Damian Ma. He is the director and co-founder of Macro Polo, the in-house think tank at, Ma at the Paulson Institute. Next is Alaria Mazzocco. Alaria is a senior research associate at Macro Polo, where she focuses on China's energy landscape, industrial policy, and the intersection with environmental policy. She holds a PhD from the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. And then next, but not last, is Matt Sheehan, who's a, also a fellow at Macro Polo. He leads the work on US-China technology issues with a specialization in artificial intelligence. So I wanna thank you to our panel today. And before I kick it back over to Damien, just a few housekeeping items. We are going to take questions at the end. So just use that Q&A section at the bottom of your Zoom picture and ask any questions in there. And we'll try and get to everything by the, by the end of the call. And then if we don't get to your questions, please join us on Twitter where Alaria and Matt will answer the rest. So with all that said, I will hand it over to Damien and let him get started. Thank you very much, Kristen. And uh, despite these slight technical difficulties, I hope you'll still be able to listen like a podcast. Uh, it, I, I think this will be a very engaging conversation. Um, and uh, you know, really, really glad to be here with my colleagues, Matt and Laria, uh, to cover. I think you know uh, some some topics that that are really front of front of mind for a lot of people. Um, so, as I'm sure many of you have uh, probably read or heard, that there's just been a lot of talk about tech specifically. And um, as we know that, uh, especially in the last few months, it seems like the transition uh, to, a, to a clean energy future has, has mo more uh, pro progress on, on behind it than we've seen in quite some time. So rather than keep big tech separate from green tech, we thought, you know, why don't we combine it and really try to cover the gamut because there are some parallels and there are some interesting overlaps between the two as well, um, particularly in terms of, uh, you know, their, their progress in China and also some of the competitive dynamics, obviously very different technology. Uh, if, you know, uh, broadly speaking, bits versus atoms, if you will, um, in terms of a easy, easy dichotomy uh, division, but there are definitely actually parallels. Oh, there they are. Hey, there we go. <laughs> now, now I get to uh, uh, see their faces. So um, we wanna cover the gamut. And like I said, we wanna cover kind of three basic themes in our conversation. And you know, I'll be moderating, and, and I'll be just uh, you know talking to both of them on 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 each of the areas. But basically, we want to cover sort of how we got here, sort of you know really unpacking what exactly happened um, that both on the clean tech side and the big tech side, because I think there's a lot of uh, narrative driven uh, views that 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 I think don't necessarily get at you know what 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 actually happened. And I think for me, that's something I'm curious about. And two, kind of what the current state of play is on both sides, big tech and, and, and green tech. And then, you know, we just had a big plan come out of China. That's not just for the next five years, but, you know, potentially the next 10 or 15. And so we're gonna talk, talk a little bit about how we see things going forward over the next five to 10 years. So let me begin with how we got here. The, uh, the way I've been thinking about it, and you guys can tell me if I'm completely off or, 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 or somewhat on point, but if, you, if, you, if we go back, rewind back to 2009, the death of the global financial crisis, right? There was China just dropped one of the biggest stimulus it's, it's, it's ever done. I think at the time it was more than 10% of the GDP, um, which is huge for China at the time. And the, at, at that time, there was barely any inkling of, you know, tech innovation coming out of China. The narrative was certainly not that. And when it came to the stimulus, uh, there was a lot of the prevailing narrative was it was a lot of waste. Uh, for sure, there was a lot of waste, and it, it kind of led to a lot of the boom and bust cycles in the clean uh, clean tech sector. Uh, you know, solar and wind. It wasn't clear at the time that those renewables would actually survive. 
or at least if you know that's what I recall the prevailing narrative being China was still a copycat nation there was no there was people didn't know what Tencent was and even though it's been around for 20 years at the time and then you fast forward to about 2020 so in that 10 years something happened and somehow the narrative has corrected dramatically the pendulum has swung entirely to the other side which I'm not sure if that if that's accurate either so I just want to try to see so, sort of what happened on the big tech side um, and, and, and what did we miss? And also on the clean tech side. So let me start with kind of the bits. Let me let me go to Matt first and then kind of go through that. Sure. Yeah. Um, the period of time you're sort of describing here, yeah, fits very well with my you know biggest window into China. I first spent time there for the summer in 2008, moved there in 2010 and kind of watched a lot of this rise in sort of real capabilities and then change in narrative sort of over the past decade, basically. And I think, you know, you uh, focus there on the stimulus component of that and where does that figure in? I think that maybe not the financial crisis stimulus, but sort of later government tech stimuluses figure into it. I think it's kind of one part of a three piece puzzle. I usually, my sort of mental model for the way that China has stimulated innovation in its domestic economy over the past 10 plus years is that it starts with uh, sort of laying the foundation, which is a large and a semi-protected market. Large so that it's big enough to create really intense competitive dynamics domestically. Semi-protected such that, you know, you basically don't have the foreign internet companies come in and steamroll the local startups before they ever get off the ground. Um, so you have this kind of dynamic where it's, it's actually kind of a lot like the old uh, economic theory of import substitution. That was a popular way that people thought, you know, economies in the developing world were gonna grow by blocking foreign imports and just letting sort of domestic manufacturing come up. And it, it didn't work in the eighties and nineties for developing countries, but I think a version of it has actually worked pretty well in China in the sense of, you know, it was a, it was a the great firewall has always been somewhat porous. So it lets a lot of ideas from the outside world come in. It lets, you know, uh, Chinese people sort of still, especially entrepreneurs or technology workers, lets them see and access foreign websites. It lets them know what's going on at the cutting edge of global tech, but it creates enough friction that the local startups are still allowed to grow. So this kind of large and semi-protected market is what I think is their foundation on this. The second step in that process is a real mass uh, of injection of physical and financial resources. So this kind of parallels what you're describing with the stimulus efforts in the sense that, you know, I'm talking about a flood of resources, both in terms of talent, like churning out a just very large quantity of engineers, um, sort of government investment, whether that's direct investment, whether that's through government guidance funds, uh, the building up of physical infrastructure, you know, all of the construction of Innovation Street or building out thousands of incubators throughout Chinese cities during the government's Shuang uh, Shuang uh, is a mass innovation, mass entrepreneurship campaign. Um, or in the case of like with the AI push, it's the government building out infrastructure specifically to sort of test and put into play AI stuff like um, autonomous vehicles, you know, say the government of Suzhou, city of government of Suzhou building out uh, facilities specifically for testing fields. I think this is maybe the most controversial step in the process in a lot of ways, because at the ground level, it looks very, very messy. It looks very, very wasteful. Like I, uh, my first year in Xi'an or in China was spent in Xi'an, where they have the high tech development zone of Xi'an, which was basically a bunch of, you know, uh, semiconductor buildings, semiconductor um, companies with their windows smashed out and boarded up with, you know, the kind of blue fencing that you see all over China. So you have this phenomenon of the government pouring a bunch of money into the field and trying to sort of stimulate excitement and stimulate activity that looks very bad on the local level lots of times, but I see it as basically the government placing a bet saying, yeah, we might waste a lot of money on a lot of empty incubators. Yeah, we might build out a lot of, you know, maybe high speed rail track or uh, AV testing facilities before they're useful. But we're betting that this technology is transformative enough that if we can kind of accelerate its deployment, it'll lever up the economy as a whole. So you got this large semi-protected market you flood it with resources. 
I think the third and final piece of that is maintaining connections to the global cutting edge of technology. So, you know, despite the firewall, despite all that China has done to, um, you know, aggravate foreign technology companies, there still have been deep connections between the two sides for a very long time. So you've got, you know, foreign labs in China, Microsoft Research Asia or Google's AI lab. You have Chinese investors in Silicon Valley. You have people moving between, say, the Chinese tech ecosystem working in Silicon Valley and going back. So you main, maintain this kind of uh, connective tissue where even if the websites, even if the products are blocked, Chinese entrepreneurs, innovators, technologists still have that kind of exposure to what's happening at the absolute global frontier. And so, you know, this is, this is in many ways a high level picture, but I see it when you look at the way that the mobile internet took off in China, when you look at the way that artificial intelligence took off in China. And I think we're gonna see future versions of this in kind of um, industrial applications of emerging technology. It's this three-step large semi-protected market. It's large enough to draw in foreign resources, but it's protected enough to let the local startups flourish. You flood it with resources. It looks very wasteful. It looks very messy, but you're trying to lever up. And then you maintain these ties with the global cutting edge in order to um, sort of set some direction, have some exposure to that level and, and sort of point the ecosystem in that direction. That's my sort of three-step model for the last decade. So I, wanna, so, so I wanna follow up on that um, and in just a bit. And I sure. think you, you raised some interesting points about the key, key ingredients, but let me turn to Ilaria on the clean tech side. I know it's obviously a very different technology and the progress is obviously slightly different, but I guess, let me, let me slightly tweak my, my initial question a little bit was, you know, in retrospect, was, was part of a stimulus somehow actually a bit of a green stimulus that, that kind of led to some of the developments in the renewable sector? Wonder, wondering how you see that you know, progressing over the last uh, 10, or, 10 or 11 years. So I think the timing is correct, right? I mean, after 2000, like around 2010, that's when you really see a lot of these Chinese companies uh, starting to, to grow within these industries, right? Certainly in, in solar and, and, and automotive, um, you know, battery and, and electric vehicles, that's, that's sort of like the beginning of the, of the policies that then have, have you know, have product, uh, produced such like incredible results in China, right? So I think the timing is right, but I think the dynamics actually precede the, the, the stimulus and, the, um, um, and the, the global financial crisis. I mean, if you think about it, the, the renewable energy law was actually put in, uh, came into uh, effect in 2006, right? So that's before that. And already there was, um, you know, for electric vehicles, you know, the Ministry of Science and Technology, uh, it's yes, 2008 was an important year, but that really was because that's when Wang Gang became the head of the Ministry of Science and Technology and really started pushing electric vehicles, right? So it's, there's a different, I think there's, there's different moving parts and I don't want to, you know, certainly the stimulus benefited the economy as a whole. So certainly some, you know, the, the, it benefited uh, clean uh, technologies as well, but I don't think, you know, it was actually a very polluting, very dirty stimulus. So I don't want to overstate that. What I would say is what perhaps, um, you know, what perhaps was not predictable at the time was that the market was going to grow so spectacularly, right? And that the government was going to uh, in, introduce all these policies to support the growth of the market. Uh, so, you know, it was it just unimaginable at the time that then that today China would have almost 300 gigawatts of wind, over 200 gigawatts of solar, right? Uh, and, the, and that's really um, pushed the industry forward. I think what we've learned over the past 10 years is that you really can't have a successful um, renewable energy industry, or at least it's very hard to have one if you don't have a domestic or regional market, uh, or at least a market where your, industry, where your companies can uh, you know, really succeed. And that's what we've seen in China. Uh, you know, the global financial crisis was actually quite important for the solar industry in a, a counterintuitive way, which is that in, uh, in Europe, uh, the subsidies were cut quite, uh, quite suddenly, actually, as a result of the, of the crisis. And that led, uh, the, you know, that's, that sort of was the beginning of the Chinese uh, solar market, which now we know was an incredible success, right? So, and, and really helped these companies. So I think, as I said, the timing is correct, but we shouldn't forget also that uh, you know, when we say expanding the market here, we're talking about sort of climate policies in many ways, right? And so this has been, the past decade has been an era, a time of, 
yes, incredible growth for uh, fossil fuel industry in China, right, for coal, but also uh, a time in which the, the, the country has been really moving forward quite quickly in terms of promoting renewables, of climate policy, you know, air pollution, right? These, these, these issues have become much, much more important in China. Uh, and I don't think it was necessarily um, predictable that it was going to go that way, uh, you know, if we, if we think back at 2009. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I, I like to always like to think about, you know, being an energy analyst, looking at China, you always have to have two hats, right? One is you're actually evaluating things based on their impact on climate, right? On, on decarbonization. And the other one, you actually have to think about it in terms of industrial policy and geoeconomic uh, terms, right? And I think it's useful to keep that in mind when analyzing the progress of these technologies, because that's how, how policymakers are thinking about it as well, right? So there's certainly, you know, another thing which has really benefited, I think, certain types of technology, certainly battery, for example, is has been this sort of push over the past 10 years to promote certain strategic uh, sectors, right? So that sort of the targeted industrial policy, the, the made in China 2025, uh, emerging strategic industries, that's really benefited certain types of technologies. I mean, I think certainly in, in, in Matt's case, but, you know, when you look at, for example, battery, that's been very helpful. So I think there's been this merging of of different types of policies, different trends that have really, you know, there's been a convergence of, uh, of supporting uh, types of policies and interests. So you guys kind of dance around this, uh, this, this thing a little bit. So this is my kind of follow up, and then we'll move on to the next uh, section. Um, but, you know, it sounds like there's a higher tolerance of let's call it waste in China. In, in, in the sense that if they can get, you know, they get some waste, but they get some winners too, and and, and they're okay with that. Um, but the bigger question, uh, tying all this together, is also what we're you know debating in this country is is the extent and scope of industrial policy, and how effective it, you know, is. It's probably not going to be Chinese style industrial policy, but in both of your cases, uh, uh, you know, how important was industrial policy? And also, it is interesting that. Um, in big tech and green tech, a lot of renewable companies and the big tech are basically, they're all, they're, they're private firms still, right? Sure, they have state support, but they're basically private firms. Um, and uh, so how important really was industrial policy versus let's say, uh, you know, kind of market dynamics in each one of your areas? I don't care who goes first. Yeah, sure, I'll, I'll go in. Um, I think, it, it, in some ways, it partly depends what we mean by industrial policy, like the area where China has set out the clearest set of goals and said in this very specific technology, we're going to achieve this very specific end. Um, here, I'm thinking of semiconductors as part of the Made in China 2025 plan and the 13th five year plan. They set very specific goals for um, building up a domestic semiconductor industry. And as of right now, uh, just five years away from the end of Made in China 2025, they're extremely far behind in that on, on reaching those goals. So when they set this kind of, at least in, in my field, when they set this very targeted, um, relatively narrow goal to which there is a real sort of real technological hurdles and real market hurdles, they have not proved successful. I think where they have proved successful is when there's, say, a market trend that's already well underway. So uh, basically, when there's a market trend well underway, and then they're able to add a lot of fuel to that fire and add a lot of resources to that equation, I think they've been successful. So with like the sort of big, massive explosion in mobile internet uh, activity, startups, and like economically profitable startups, that trend was well underway by 2014 when Li Keqiang announced the kind of Shuang Chuang uh, mass innovation, mass entrepreneurship campaign, but the government has an ability to drum up investment, drum up support, drum up excitement among you know, investors, among normal people, and just kind of influence the public thinking on that. And I think to some extent, the same thing with AI. The AI trend was very much underway when China announced its plan in 2017, but by the government saying, this is super important, Everyone, you know, SOEs, private industries focus on this, investors focus on this. And um, also we're just gonna throw a lot of resources at this kind of diffuse goal, not a very specific goal like chips, but a diffuse goal. I think both of those times it's proved successful, um, but I'm curious to hear what uh, Ilaria's take on green tech. Uh, 
Yeah, I mean, I think it, I agree that the, fact, the idea that it kind of depends how you define industrial policy, right? It's a feed-in tariff industrial policy, probably, right? I mean, especially when it comes, when, uh, you know, the-, the It's definitely the, industrial policy. It's different, right? I, exactly. I would say it's the classic, I mean, it's supporting an industry, right? Exactly, you know? exactly. But it's also, an, it's also a climate policy, right? Which I think we should recognize, right? It's also very, uh, very it has other, uh, other benefits to it, right? But certainly, you know, yes, there's there's been this, uh, you know, the, the 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 policies to promote renewables in China, which certainly come fall under sort of climate policy. They have acted, they have served industrial policy objectives. So I think that's been very very important. Um, you know, I, I would say one thing about the 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 idea that that industrial policy is extremely wasteful. Um, well, there is a, and I'm going to not quote it correctly, but there is a quote by Chalmers Johnson, the, the, the famous uh, scholar who theorized the you know, industrial policy in Japan, right? And he has a quote, um, I think it's on the book on Miti and the, the, the miracle, the Japanese development miracle, but the, he, uh, he says, you know, he compares Japanese policymakers and American policymakers and how they evaluate uh, policy. And he says, Americans focus on the efficiency, right? So the cost. And the Japanese focus on outcomes. So they don't care about how, how costly it's going to be. Now, this is not to say that either this is true or that this it means that one is better than the other. But I think it says something about how, you know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, right? So it really depends on how willing your society is to, to, to take these kinds of gambles, how much, you know, cash your economy has, uh, how, you know, how critical these technologies are and how much failure you're willing to accept, right? Uh, if you think back of, uh, you know, during the Obama year of Solyndra, obviously in the U.S., you're not willing to, we're not willing to accept a lot of failure, right? But in China, that's, you know, par for the course. We know that a ton of these companies are going to fail from, you know, from the start, it's, it's assumed. So I think it's a different type of, uh, so I think that's it's something to, to keep in mind when we talk more and more about industrial policy in this country is that it's not, you know, it's not a sure bet. It is something, it is a gamble, which is what Matt said. And it can, uh, it can be a failure in certain aspect, in respects, but it can also pay off, so. All right, so let's 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 you know, no matter which side you come down on industrial policy, whether it's it's got it, it's got its problems and, and and it's got its sort of positive externalities. Uh, I would say I think I, I don't think I'm out of line in saying if the Chinese Chinese government were, were looking back on it, their return on investment, they would probably say it's pretty good when it comes to big tech and green tech. You know, it's in 2020 they're like it's pretty good um, for the most part. And uh, they got companies. They got so. So, what's kind of the current state of play uh, when it comes to uh, China's technological competitiveness and advantages uh, on both sides, the bits and atoms, and also and also its weaknesses? You know, it, it, sure, there's money, ideas, and people, right? So, it, it seems like China has a lot more money now than than it did back in 2009. Capital is not not a huge problem. So, you know, but that might be a problem when it comes to you know a green tech because it's a lot about capacity and, and scaling. So of these kind of three three things, and maybe there's a fourth thing that, that we're missing, what is, how do you how do you assess kind of the competitive advantage of strength and weaknesses now in China's big tech side and also the green tech side? Uh, Ilaria, why don't we go with okay, green tech? Sure, yeah. So, I mean, I think, I think the, um, so China's competitive advantage has really been so far scale and the manufacturing, um, you know, capabilities that the Chinese companies have. That Chinese companies have, and that's not to diminish the types of, you know, there's been innovation as well. But, but really, especially if you look at something like solar, uh, you know, improvements on the manufacturing process and scaling have been just, you know, spectacular. Now, when it comes to, um, you know, sort of second generation or the next generation technologies, I don't know that it's so clear the Chinese companies are going to be leading in that. In, in that, I mean, certainly there, there, you know, there's a lot of investment, but I think there's actually been, uh, you know, there, there is uh, official government documents have been focusing a lot on basic, uh, on basic research and breakthrough technologies. 
And I, I think that reflects a concern that perhaps Chinese companies are not going to be the ones doing uh, that sort of breakthrough research on, on some of these technologies. Can you now, give some examples of what some of those kind of leading edge technologies might yeah, be that people are looking at? Absolutely. So I think, you know, so solar, uh, for example, there's a lot of focus now on perovskite uh, solar cells. Um, and there's a lot of research happening in different countries, right? And uh, the, I think the challenge, uh, I'm, not, I'm no expert, but I think one of the challenges is actually ensuring that, it's, that the technology is stable and, uh, and durable, right? Um, so I think that there's an open question of who's going to create that perfect uh, perovskite cell that is you know, high, much more efficient than the cells that we have now, right? That's the, that's the idea. Uh, and then the crystalline uh, silicone cells. So the um, so I, I think there's an open all question. Right, can, 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 sorry, I, I'm just personally curious. What's Prosk like? Where what is, is that naturally? Is a what is it? It's a is, that a, it, is it like a engineered thing, or is there something found in nature? I I, I think it's engineered. I don't know. Okay, all right. Sorry. So it's, like, it's, like, it's like a new. It's like a new I evolution. The chemical. I. I <laughs> So, so it's, 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 it's like a next evolution beyond polysilicon yeah. or, or, or monocrystalline silicon, silicon. It's not, yeah. silicon, it's not silicon based, right? Is it silicon based? I, I don't think so, but okay. maybe some right. of the, maybe I'm wrong and the participants should tell me. I, uh, okay. I've not done extensive research on the- oh, Okay, so new, 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 new solar cells. Okay, what else? It is, it is our, the, the next hot thing for, um, for solar for solar cells and uh, the um, sorry I think yeah so it is the next hot thing is being the, researched in a lot of different countries right but now I think what we want to keep in mind is say it's a you know a European or American lab that comes up with the you know the the the, the most stable most efficient version of this and I wouldn't say it's probably not going to be one right there's going to be various iterations and it's going to keep improving right but say they do it, can they actually scale it and produce it and commercialize it in a way that makes sense without relying on Chinese manufacturing? And I think that's going to be a huge challenge, right? I think we need to keep in mind a lot of these technologies have really developed in a globalized setting. So I think now that we're thinking more and more in terms of sort of national, uh, you know, national security of supply chains and um, uh, you know, and and uh, we're, we're being driven more and more towards competition rather than cooperation, there may be some challenges there in terms of then actually getting these on the market. And one thing I would like to highlight is, you know, technology is really important, right? But uh, in, in in green tech, and I think this is a little different from uh, from the, the technology areas of math studies, is that you you improvements are great, but they need to be cost effective, right? If you get, for example, a one solar panel that's you know as efficient as five, as five solar panels that we currently have on the market, if it's more costly than those five solar panels, it's probably not going to take off. Developers are not going to pick it up, right? So, so I think that's really the challenge is getting it at that price and that sort of quality that actually is a breakthrough. And I think that's going to be, uh, you know, I think that's certainly going to be, a, a, you know, for batteries, right? We're 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 trying to like, you know, go to to get cheaper and more effective and uh, durable batteries. And we, you know, lithium ion is certainly again another area where China is doing very very well. But there are other types of batteries that may be better suited, for example, for large scale storage. Um, and uh, you know, it's again, we, you know, I don't, I don't feel competent to say who's dominating, which technology is going to take over. But again, I don't know that it's clear that it's Chinese companies that are doing the best uh, when it comes to um, to the research. Now, when it comes to manufacturing, it's a different question, right? I, I think part of the ch challenge, I think part of the reason why there's so much focus now on industrial policy in the U.S. is because there's a realization that when it comes to large scale manufacturing, the U.S. is a bit lagging, right? When it actually comes to commercializing a lot of these um, uh, breakthrough technologies, the U.S. has not been as effective as uh, perhaps it used to be and certainly not as effective as China has been. So how dominant is China now in the solar supply chain? Oh, it's absolutely dominant, right? Like I think it's uh, it's 70 uh, percent of solar panels are made in China. And I think if you go and look at where some of the other, you know, some of the other panels are made, it's, uh, they're actually ch it's Chinese companies, right? So like Malaysia, for example, and even in the US. So I think, you know, when we look at uh, silicon crystalline technology, China has absolutely got that, right? It's, you know, it is a science, but they've got it down to a science, right? Like they, they're very effective, very efficient. But, um, and so I think, you know, we, we know where the supply chains stand now and China's doing very well, right? So 
about half of the wind turbines are, are made by Chinese companies. Lithium ion, like, you know, CATL is like one of the top uh, producer, BYD also one of the top uh, battery producers. Uh, solar panels, absolutely, you know, the, the technology is dominated by Chinese companies. But the question is, you know, these aren't, these aren't going to be the final, in 30 years, we're probably going to be using very different or like a different iteration of these same technologies, right? So who's going to be dominating those technologies? And I think that's where there's a bit of a, you know, there's a bit of an open question and there's is possible a possibility for, for, for competition there. Um, but as I said, it's difficult to imagine some of these companies in, in, uh, in uh, outside of China being able to then commercialize and manufacturing them at the same scale as China. Mm. All right, so let's go from polysilicon to, to, to another application of silicon. Uh, so similar question, sort of in kind of the big tech software, uh, you know, uh, those kinds of areas, uh, the advanced research areas, where, where, where do you see China sort of in terms of stacking up in terms of its competitiveness and, and some of its weaknesses? Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's obviously saying, you know, big tech or even information tech, we're talking about such a diffuse range of applications that kind of coming up with a uh, uh, a ranking is near impossible, but I'll, I'll kind of zoom in on the uh, artificial intelligence piece of the puzzle where I spend the most time and where it's a little bit easier to make some head to head comparisons. Um, so I think in a lot of ways, we're in a much better place now in understanding this kind of competitive dynamic than just a few years ago. I think 20 circa 2017 or 2018, there was tons and tons of uh, sort of political energy and hype and, uh, you know, much ink spilled over Chinese capabilities and US capabilities, but we really didn't know what we were talking about. We didn't know how to compare them. We didn't have anything, any, we couldn't drill down into sort of specifics that were measurable. I think a lot of the progress in this field over the last three or four years is basically taking that big concept of AI and AI competitiveness and breaking it down into sort of specific categories, specific subfields of AI, specific applications. And so there we can speak a little bit more directly to sort of the competitive advantage. And I'll look, the, the easiest way to compare head to head is on the research publications piece of the puzzle. That's one where we can kind of direct, we have direct vision into the capabilities, um, comparative capabilities. Whereas when we say, you know, is TikTok, you know, applying AI better than YouTube? Probably because it's an AI driven product, but, uh, you know, it's, it's unclear how meaningful that is when YouTube is, you know, a global and an American platform. So on the research front, Within AI, um, some things have become very clear. On computer vision, um, so broadly the, the underlying technology behind facial recognition, object recognition, object tracking, all these areas, this is the area where China is, is the strongest. It's probably the one area of uh, AI research where China has a clear lead over the United States and the rest of the world. You know, you could say that this is clearly in some way driven or pulled by the demand on the Chinese side. There is huge demand for surveillance technology and the science that underlies that. But China also, you know, even before the surveillance state was kind of built up to the level it was now, China did make sort of fundamental advances in computer vision, fundamental advances in how you construct neural networks that gave it kind of a head start in computer vision. Um, story is a little bit different when you look at other subfields of AI. So natural language processing, sort of the ability to read and understand text or now to generate text. That's one area where the US uh, is usually sort of described as a head in total publications and especially in kind of the breakthrough landmark things. So GPT-3 came out of uh, the American lab OpenAI and that was very much a sort of a fundamental game changer in how we think about language understanding and language tech, uh, text generation by computers and that came out of the US. So NLP, you know, more on the US side, computer vision, more going on in China. And then there's, you know, dozens more subfields from, you know, robotics to uh, maybe more foundational basic research and constructing neural networks, et cetera, et cetera. But I'd say, you know, if we kind of sum all these parts together, most people would say the US is still producing more of the research that makes an impact and moves the field forward globally, but it varies a lot depending on what subfield you look at. Um, so in the, in the interest of time, let's move on to kind of the last section, which is kind of looking, try to, try to, try to, you know, base into crystal, crystal ball a little bit, which is always a bit of risky, but we do have a concrete plan out. 
And this, this plan is not quite like previous plans. Uh, I think we've written about that a little bit. There's, there seems to be a shift in the macro environment, whether it's tied to the GDP target or just the fact that they're looking a lot more beyond, beyond just these five years. But obviously anything beyond five or 10, it's, it's very hard to figure out given technology is very dynamic and things change a lot. But, um, and we don't have to cover everything right now and we can save some for the Q and A, but so, so, sort of bottom line, how are you guys reading not not kind of the overall bit, but kind of in your areas of sort of you know information tech, so to speak, infrastructure, you know, digital infrastructure, uh, and also on the green tech side, what is what do you think China's where is China going in the next five to ten years? Let's start with Ilaria. Where do you think China is going to be going, and and what what does it intend to do? Whether you know, or, or and, and also uh, unrelatedly, the aspiration versus the reality of it. Yeah, I mean, I think we know some of these, at least, you know, the more mature of these technologies, we have clear targets, right? We, we know that by 2030, they want to have 1200 gigawatts of solar and wind installed. Uh, and, and, you know, and we know that uh, the electric vehicles, again, there's, there's some very ambitious targets out there. Uh, for the next few years th that weren't actually in the five-year plan right but these have these are sort of like we know that these these have been sort of like announced over the past few years so uh, we know that battery lithium-ion batteries the solar wind these are going to do continue to do quite well uh um, hydrogen fuel cell technology uh you know depending on whether you consider nuclear either a new technology or renewable like nuclear also has gotten a bit of a push in the, in the um, five-year plan so, you know, I think we know that despite um, the falling subsidies for these, uh, for these um, uh, technologies, we know that the government is quite committed to them, right? And that fits within the whole sort of peaking by 2030, carbon neutrality by 2060, which again, just, just knowing that you would, we would be pretty bullish on, on renewables, right? Um, I do think the fact that subsidies are, are you know, being eventually going to be phased out and already have declined sharply is going to be, you know, introduces a certain element of uncertainty, uh, both and because, you know, obviously the industries have sort of thrived thanks to subsidies. Um, and, you know, for example, the, the China has had a spectacular growth in wind this past year, uh, but that's, you know, perhaps also, you know, I think large part due to the fact that subsidies are going to fall sharply after that. So that's, uh, um, uh, you know, that's sort of like a rushing to, to get there before the subsidy ends. So we'll have to see then this year how, what, the, what the result is, right? So I, I think that that's a certain element of uncertainty. The other element of uncertainty is that subsidies have been this sort of key industrial policy tool in the sense that it's been linked to improvements in the technologies, right? So it's a very, um, uh, useful tool and, and actually sort of controlling or not controlling, but sort of directing the industry in a way. Uh, now, in certain cases, they have alternatives to that. For example, uh, the dual credit uh, system for electric vehicles, uh, really, you know, that's going to continue to have, uh, you know, the, to, to drive forward the, the, the industry um, and, and battery technology, despite the, the you know, the, the, the subsidies are basically going to be phased out the next uh, year or so. Um, so th that's going to be present. So, you know, I think the market overall is probably going to continue to grow despite, but despite this uncertainty. Now, the other thing that I, you know, I think in the five-year plan is, is uh, emphasized, but I already sort of mentioned this is, is basic to uh, basic research breakthroughs. And I think that points to sort of that concern about whether, you know, the idea is, well, we're doing quite well right now. Will we continue to do well um, in the future? And I think they want to sort of secure that by doing these sort of longer term investments. But I don't think that we're going to have to see the results of, you know, for you know, that, that takes a few years to actually see, you know, bring any results, if any. Right. So, so just so a I final just a final quick question, big, big question before I turn over to, to Matt, um, how uh, what is the seriousness with which I know there's been some uh, conflicting signals out of China, but what is what is the seriousness with which they're intending to peak carbon by 2030? Oh, I think that's pretty serious. Uh, you know, I think that, you know, I think the challenge is that there's no you can peak as high as you want. Right. So I think right now what we're seeing is sort of this negotiation for for the short term. 
we know that you know they have to peak by 2030 and all the you know the SOEs know it the provinces know it and they're all drafting their own plans right which are going to be really crucial and I think we'll see the action plan next year and that's going to be really important uh, but uh, but I think what we're seeing now with the expansion in coal capacity is a bit of a rush to get in the coal before restrictions come in and uh, because you know this the next five years are the sort of negotiation of like you know how much coal can I get before knowing that in 30 years that all the coal plants need not all but you know many coal plants will have to shut down so this is the last moment in which a, a province can actually obtain new coal plants so I think now we're seeing this sort of very problematic right because if you peak too high that's going to make it much harder than to achieve carbon neutrality in 2060 uh, so I think we're seeing this sort of very problematic negotiation but I think it's uh, the commitment is quite serious okay Matt what's your what's your bottom line for the next few years. Bye. Yeah, I, I see it. And at least in some ways parallel what Ilaria was describing with basic research and applications. I see Chinese tech ambitions kind of proceeding on three tracks simultaneously where there's a bit of a trade off between the three of them. So the first one is very much this self reliance component, which is a question of can we reinforce the foundations of our technology stack? It's, you know, starting in say 2018, we realized that if the US decides to pull the plug on chips for some of our largest companies, they may just very well crumble. And so we need to sort of reinforce that foundation where we may not be pushing the limits, we may not be doing something that's economically profitable, we just can't have this fundamental weakness. So I see that as like the self reliance thing, and it's mostly about chips. Um, I think the basic research and the sort of cutting edge research that Ilaria referred to in green tech, same thing is happening in, in China's push in other industries. There's a lot of emphasis uh, both in this and if you look back at sort of the AI plan of we want to make world, we want to push the global technological frontier in fields. And I think maybe one example of this um, for China is in quantum computing or quantum uh, telecommunications, quantum information where you know, this technology is probably not economically profitable on this sort of five-year horizon. Um, it would be technically a money loser in, if we were to do work on it now, but they do see an opportunity to push the global frontier in certain areas, and they want to continue to do that, whether or not it you know, makes them more self-reliant, whether or not it's economically productive. And the third or last one is this kind of economically productive applications of emerging technology in a lot of industries that haven't applied them yet. So this, the Chinese terms that have kind of come up around this are new infrastructure, which is about sort of laying like the foundation for a lot of industry autonomous vehicles to apply sort of mature technologies. And the other way, maybe the most uh, prominent way this is kind of being touted right now is with um, what's called the industrial internet, where the idea is we're going to take a lot of very mature technologies in computer vision, in maybe even robotics, and we're going to apply them to upgrading our entire indu industrial base. You know, if things were kind of left as they were, probably on over a 10 year, 15 year horizon, rising wages, uh, you know, growing middle class, a desire to move out of these industrial tech industries would probably lead to a decline in China's industrial base. And they say, can technology come in here and fill this hole, kind of turbocharge the, you know, the big made in China engine for 10 to 15 years. And so you've got these three tracks that often get kind of just like put under the umbrella of China tech ambition. But I think it's a very different thing to try to reinforce your weakness in chips from trying to push your sort of uh, research strength in quantum from having economically productive ap uh, applications of technology to like existing industries. I think we might see something of a trade off in these, you know, what is China more, it, it talks about all of them in the five year plan. It says we're going to push the global frontier, we're going to become self reliant, and we want to build a modern industrial, you know, base. But if we assume there is some limit on resources and some limit on just kind of bureaucratic energy, they're going to have to make some trade offs here. My, you know, hard to predict. They're very big on basic research right now, but I think that's the kind of conviction that might wane if they were to, say, have another, you know, sort of existential threat to their supply chain in terms of chips. And it doesn't, you know, pushing quantum 
computing doesn't necessarily uh, put money in the pockets of all of the people up and down the bureaucracy who want to get paid and might get paid better off uh, with sort of economically productive applications. All right, one final very quick gut reaction question that's fun and then we'll throw it to the audience. China's going to, and for the both of you, China will break through, have a breakthrough in quantum first or nuclear fusion? Uh, I'll go quantum, but that's mostly Varia, what I don't know about agree. nuclear fusion. <laughs> I actually have no idea. I, I don't know anything maybe that's about the audience. quantum and I don't uh, like Maybe that's for the audience, stuff. but, uh, but uh, uh, you know, uh, we, we can turn it to questions. Kristen, should I look at the uh, questions? Yeah, absolutely. Or I can read them out to you if you like. Sure, go for it. Sure. So we have one question from David Clayton. He, these are, it's, it's a two-part question. So given the obvious rising geostrategic tensions in the bilateral US-China relationship, how do you see the role of multilateral engagement on climate, UN COP? Will increasingly want to act, will, will China increasingly want to act on its own or be seen to be drawn in to, a, to global efforts? On the tech questions, maybe let's answer that one first. Um, I mean, I think we need to recognize the, the multi multilateral engagements of climate are really important, right? They sort of drive, they, they provide guidance, they sort of drive different countries. It's, it brings countries to, forces countries to come up with targets, that kind of thing, right? But when it comes to actual action and implementation, then of course countries, uh, you know, domestic situation is going to be, uh, you know, often supersedes any kind of commitment they've made globally, right? So I don't think we should, you know, I think when in thinking of China acting on its own, I mean, all countries have really acted on their own, quote unquote, when it comes to sort of the Paris Agreement. It's, it's voluntary targets that countries set. Uh, and they're, you know, frankly, non-binding, right? Because it's they're set by the country and implementation is, is brought forth by the country. So it, it, what you see is countries deciding to sort of be more or less ambitious and therefore providing certain type of leadership. Um, and, uh, you know, like the European Union has been quite good at being very ambitious on these kinds of, 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 of things. And I think China is showing increasing willingness to be uh, uh, ambitious. Um, that's, I think, at least what we've seen uh, in, you know, in September. But, uh, you know, will it be even more ambitious? I think generally speaking, the way the, the Chinese leadership has approached this is to be quite cautious when it makes a promise because it wants to be able to, to keep it, right? So I think that's part of the challenge. You know, I think the question will be, when will the US start showing real leadership on climate issues, which, uh, you know, so far the US has just not been as, uh, um, you know, ambitious as, as it could have been, but I think that might change under the Biden administration. So that's an area to look at. And then from there to see, you know, how does that com compare in, uh, with China? So that really leads us to another question. So Biden has talked a lot about re-engaging allies, leaning on our diplomatic alliances to boost trade. Which countries do you see as the most promising partners for the U.S. in big tech and green tech? Should uh, I go forward? Um, uh, Matt or Ilaria? Either one. I'll, I'll jump in with some with a quick word on big tech stuff. So I think it very much depends on what the goal is for one of the most front and center goals, which is um, sort of depriving China of the ability to domestically produce cutting edge chips. There's a very specific configuration of countries who have who, who need to be involved. It's the Netherlands, it's Japan, South Korea and Taiwan in a certain way. Like only a few countries are really involved in this process in a very meaningful way. Um, and so you, you, can, you don't necessarily need to bring in all of Europe or you don't need to bring in developing world countries like India to sort of create these choke points and chips. But if the US, for example, wants to make sure that you know, Chinese uh, 5G technology doesn't sort of get built up, the infrastructure doesn't get built up in developing countries, you need a very different configuration of countries. And I think in that case, India has kind of become a focal point in this, not that India is, you know, necessarily a competitor in 5G right now, but for other issues around just kind of the diffusion of Chinese technology into the developing world, India is seen as kind of a bulwark in that area. And then for maybe the broader, uh, sort of ethical, normative, uh, what kind of a digital future do we want type questions. 
we're, the, the US very much wants to target Europe as the main partner in this. I think that's gonna be significantly harder than people imagine. I think a lot of people um, kind of erroneously believed, oh, once Trump is out, all these Europeans will just kind of like jump back into our arms and we'll be, you know, just like we were the good old days. You know, Europe and US actually have a lot of conflict on technology norms. Uh, we're very far apart on privacy and Europe through stuff like the Digital Services Act is planning another sort of big regulatory push that is gonna make a lot of American companies mad. Um, but I'd say they're, they're are the partner that we're looking to. So that brings me to another question from Mega Party. She writes, how do you see the recently launched US India AI initiative? Do you think there is a China angle there? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll take this uh, relatively quickly. Um, I think it's unclear. And I think what I'm looking for, I, like I, I went to the sort of launch event for this or you know, attended virtually the launch event for this US India AI initiative. And what I think is the big question going forward is turning what at this point is you know, a very hand wavy, we're both on the same side type approach to technology cooperation and turning it into kind of nuts and bolts, uh, practical cooperation in meaningful ways. So yeah, right now the US and India, clearly India has a lot of problems with China right now, stemming in some part from the border dispute. The US obviously has a lot of its problems. You know, we're both kind of, you know, democracies and we both just see each other as, as partners here. So there's a lot of, at least I can speak to the DC side of it. There's a lot of, um, hopefulness and sort of energy saying, yes, US and India are partners. But I think the way this is gonna get actualized is if you have greater sort of cross-pollination between the tech ecosystems, if you have US companies and investors going into India and building linkages with Indian startups, if you have greater sort of two-way flow of people and if there are say more research partnerships. This is actually, you know, China actually did a very good job of this in building these ties with India from like 2014 to 2019. So I think in order to kind of move this from the realm of rhetoric to you know, meaningful action, we need to focus our energies in that area. Or those who hope to build these ties need to focus our energy in that area. Excellent. So this question is really for Alaria, but Matt, feel free to chime in. So Chinese industrial policy and renewable seems, seems to address the integration of generation, wind, solar transmission over long ranges and distribution management smart grid. Can we learn, can the U.S. learn from this? Um, well, I don't know that it actually, I think this is a huge problem in China right now, right? I think, yes, there's a, the big push to build the ultra high voltage lines, and that's perhaps what the question is referring to. But in terms of institutions, there's a lot of the, the, the Chinese power sector is very inflexible, and that's been a huge challenge. Uh, for integrating renewables, which, you know, uh, being very variable, they, they need a very flexible market. Uh, and there's a lot, there's not a lot of interprovincial trading as well, which is another challenge because, uh, again, you, you know, if you, if, you, if you don't have wind, uh, wind blowing in one region, maybe you have sunshine in another one, and then you can sort of trade that, that, that energy. But if you're not buying from outside your own province, then that makes it a lot harder. And that becomes a justification or, you know, a need, the need arises to have uh, peaking capacity with uh, coal plants usually. So I think there's actually huge challenges in China. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, um, uh, I, I wouldn't think that, uh, you know, just because there's a lot of emphasis on it and there's a lot of talk about this, I wouldn't uh, assume that that means that, uh, you know, the, the, the problems have been solved. Um, and in fact, there is a, a lot of emphasis right now on uh, sort of power sector reform, which is very complicated, it's going to be really hard, and it's going to take a lot of effort. Now, the US has its own issues, uh, which we should definitely address and definitely trying to solve. But I think in the US, perhaps infrastructure is um, building out the infrastructure is really important. And I think that's where we look at China, it looks like China's doing really well, but China doesn't necessarily have then the, the regulatory infrastructure to take uh, full advantage of that infrastructure. Shall we just take two more questions, Kristen, maybe? Absolutely. So this is from Kevin Watts. Would you say that in most cases, industrial policy must invest in a market trend to see increasing returns to develop cutting edge sectors of the economy? Or is it possible for industrial policy to generate an artificial trend in the absence of an existing one? Um, I'll throw in like two cents here. Uh, yeah, I, I would very much agree with that 
industrial policy is successful when it is kind of throwing fuel on the fire of a existing or real trend. And on the artificial trend front, uh, yes, absolutely. I think the reason that China has been successful, in, at least in my area of information technology in this type of industrial policy is that they made a couple of bets and those bets turned, they, they basically bet this technology will be transformative and it absolutely turned out to be true, whether it's the very, very broad applications of the mobile internet to the entire sort of economy and the way urban centers run or the way AI is having a similar sort of moment in that way. But if, for example, uh, the Chinese government were to go like all in on quantum now, or if they'd gone all in on quantum, you know, three to five years ago, they would have been betting on a technology that was promising, but that just fundamentally did not have the on, did not have the ability to turn into a very profitable, very widely distributed self-sustaining market. And I think those, you know, if they had done something like that, then, uh, or maybe even, you know, blockchain might be another example. If they had done that, um, I think we'd be sort of still doing the, you know, pointing and laughing at how silly China's planners are rather than saying, you know, how wise they appear to be. Um. I'll just add a very quick point. I think one way to think about kind of industrial policy in China in general, the way I've, I've, I've thought about it a little bit is China, typically it's happened more than once. If you, if, you, if you track it going back all the way back to the you know early 2000s, they've tended to have kind of two business cycles. One is a very much, it starts off with kind of a policy induced cycle and that's when the industrial policy happens. Uh, and, then, and then eventually that dissipates and then things consolidate You've seen it from everything from solar to every to a lot of things. One 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 clear example lately that that kind of cross pollinates with tech is the the kind of the uh, you know the bike sharing mania, right? China can manufacture a lot of bikes, and so they so there were a lot of bikes around, and then that was a policy induced cycle because they focused like we wanted to do we, we want to do bike sharing. They had a lot of policy support, and then eventually it corrects, and then it, you have to figure out when it pivots to kind of more of a market driven cycle. And that's when the things consolidate and then things become actually more profitable. And that usually leaves several, uh, you know, uh, several players that, that kind of came in during the policy induced cycle kind of just fall, fall away by the wayside. So as sort of an investor or somebody, you have to think about kind of the interaction between these two cycles. Um, if, I, if I just may, I, I think, you know, I think that that's sort of the actual sort of the, the perennial question with industrial policy, right? A lot of the industrial policy um, you know, studies looking at industrial policies have often focused on catching up, right? And that's, and that's, you know, we have all the cases of, you know, the developmental state in, in East Asia, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, uh, you know, and China to a certain extent. And, and that's often been what we, you know, what we've been focusing on. But I think now China has actually been more and more, is more and more focused on pushing the technological frontier. So I think, you know, it's, it's worth thinking about, you know, can industrial policy produce innovation? And I think in certain cases it can, right? I think it actually, um, you know, if you look at Sematech in the U.S., or you know, if you even if you think about some of these green technologies, they've really developed over time. So you know, I think the question is, you know, what is your time frame? Are you looking for a quick to return in the next ten years? Well, then industrial policy may not always be very effective. But if you're looking at a longer term uh, in, impact, sometimes industrial policy can have a really sort of revolutionary types of impacts. And I, you know, by industrial policy here, we can mean like a sub, you know. It can be that you started with some like subsidies for uh, rooftop solar, right? And or and or it can be some like very substantial grants that that have been given to certain types of companies. Um, so I think it's uh, it's I think it depends on how you define industrial policy. I think it depends what kind of results you're looking for and the time the time scale you're looking for. And I think it depends also um, and and also whether you're looking for just sort of like an actual innovation the, or, or the actual, the, the, you know, the commercialization, right? Are you looking for, for something taking over the market or are you just looking at, we invented this new thing and then from there on, you have to keep working on it to actually get it to, to the market, if that makes sense. So one last question, and I just wanna say that we can continue this conversation on Twitter. It, the link to our thread is in the chat, so please feel free to ask any questions there. But the last question is from Juan Carlos Orlandi. And I think this is a good question to end on. Despite the great effort of the Chinese economy these years, the main issue is question of confidence. Is the US-China dispute the tip of the iceberg on many other issues? 
I might need to read that question to make sure yeah, I got I'm not it right. Sure what, what they mean by the tip the, of the iceberg. The main issue is a question of confidence. Is the US trying to dispute the tip of the iceberg on many other issues? Um, I guess, you know, if my interpretation of the <laughs> question would be, you know, whether or not the US, the, the fact that we reflect so much of our energy into, in the United States, I'll say, the fact that we put so much energy into this question of us, you know, versus China compared to China, I think a lot of it is due to a, you know, it, it's very, very connected to, or maybe is just a representation of a much larger issue of Americans losing confidence in many ways in a lot of the institutions that have, um, made America into, you know, the unquestioned world superpower, the center of cultural generation, the center of technology over time. I think, you know, China was catching up with the US in a lot of ways for a long, long time before we ever worried about it. And I think the reason why they were able to do so much catch up while the US, you know, sort of mainstream discourse continued to dismiss them is because we had this underlying confidence that, you know, no matter where, you know, no matter how much ground China makes up, there's something sort of inherent about the US political system, about the US, uh, the freedoms that people enjoy in the US and other areas. And that sort of inherent value will keep us forever in, you know, in first place in a lot of ways. And I think, you know, you could just throw together a whole bunch of things started, you know, Iraq war, US financial crisis, uh, the rise of Trump, the COVID pandemic, we've had this, you know, series of events that have really, really, really undermined confidence in a lot of the sort of underpinnings of the US institution. And that make us kind of look now start looking at other models and saying, wait a minute, are, are we sure that we're, you know, destined to win this one. And so I think one of the more interesting kind of like intellectual, but also real world trends that I follow is basically how what China makes us think about our own system, what China, what uh, underlying assumptions about what drives innovation or what underlying assumption about what makes for a productive society is China slowly sort of peeling back? And then what are we left with? Or how can we sort of reinforce our own confidence in those assumptions when it's, when it's worthy or when it's, uh, it's well grounded? So I guess that would be my take on the question. Um, well, I, I think Matt answered that very well, but I would just add, you know, it, this may have not been the, the focus of the question, but it, it brings me to this the idea of like the US China is only the tip of the iceberg is well a lot of these uh, dynamics that we've been discussing we've been discussing them really in, in terms of in the context of US China competition, but these are playing out in other countries as well right and and there's competition between those countries and the US and China and between them right, I think when you're thinking of green tech actually the European Union is in some ways more important than the US, right? It has uh, more important companies. It's a bigger market for now. And, you know, Japan and, and South Korea are really important. Australia, you know, there's, there's just a lot of other countries that are becoming really involved in this. And when it comes to industrial policy, I actually think a lot of the, the big emerging economies are really looking at this carefully when it comes to green tech, right? Like India, Brazil, um, South Africa. So I think it's, uh, it's, it's worth remembering, it's not just the US and China, and certainly US and China relationship is very important for the rest of the world, but there's other, uh, there's other dynamics at play as well. Thanks, Alaria. Jamie, and let's close out, I think. Thank you both. Uh, this has been a engaging conversation and I know you guys are going to jump on Twitter briefly if, if people want to uh, continue the uh, uh, banter and, and the Q&A. Um, but thank you so much, uh, and I hope we can do it again some, some other time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for Thanks joining. Bye-bye. So Bye. -bye. Bye.